On this edition of Native Report, we attend a fashion show steeped in Ojibwe history, culture, and wearable art. You meet Ted Else, director of the St. Louis County Veterans Service Department in Minnesota. And we follow artist Carl Galboy as he begins a painting based on an Ojibwe story. We also learn what we can do to lead healthier lives and hear from our elders on this edition of Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Blandin Foundation and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Welcome to the premiere episode of our 14th season of Native Report. I'm Rita Aspinwall. And I'm Ernie Stevens. Delina White and her daughter Lavender Hunt love to share their way of life through cloth and beads, and they do so through their fashion show titled, I Am Anishinaabe. The presentation is a lesson in art, history, and culture, and a featured model at one of their recent shows is our very own Rita Aspinwall. Hours before the models walked the stage for the I Am Anishinaabe fashion show, the show's founder, Delina White, was making some last minute fixes and the models were busy with their hair and makeup. We had a lot of garments that we needed to get tried on. Um, some things didn't fit, so we had to make some alterations. And we always bring backup um, clothing, backup shoes, backup jewelry. And at the last minute, we're just really throwing everything together and everything always works perfectly. Starting from the evening, yesterday or last night, from when we all got together, um, I wanted to be sure that I had the correct information to give everybody so everybody would be thoroughly prepared and they would know what to expect. I wanted everybody to feel um, confident and reassured. It's very exciting. Everyone's really pumped up. Uh, we did our walk through so that everyone is comfortable. They know their um, stops and their turns, their pauses. I work in collaboration with my mother, Delina White, and we um, are the designers for the I Am Anishinaabe brand. Um, we started out making ribbon skirts off of the legacy from my grandmother, Kathleen. I was honored to be asked to model one of the 15 beautiful creations by Delina and Lavender. Their designs and fashions are true works of art, but two are very special and based upon events in the news. For me personally, some of the skirts um, that I'm showing are to spread knowledge and awareness about Mother Earth and about um, the water protection. I am debuting a water protection skirt um, that is all blue with sequins and the relevance of looking out to the lakes that we are so fond of and that we live around. There is a skirt that has the mother whale Taliqua on the skirt and that is to um, show significance to um, the animal world and where we at in our own place in creation. Her newborn uh, baby whale had passed and so she um, mourned that, that baby for 19 days and pushed that whale around the ocean and the other mother orcas came to her aid and so that shows um, the connection that women have to each other. We have to be good to each other and we have to empower one another as women. The beadwork that we did is so amazing and magnificent and so detail-oriented that um, I want to bring that into the show so everybody can appreciate um, who we were back in the day and then make the connection from that fashion to what we're showing and what they're seeing on the runway. So we're trying to give 
the audience a little bit of everything. So it's the different um, times when we received, uh, when we were trading with the wampum, the dentalium from the east to the west coast. And people need to understand about the Europeans that traveled from the east coast over to the Great Lakes, which is who we are. And then what dates in time did we have um, access to a particular material like the plaid, you know, and the velvets and the um, silver and the different pieces that were um, traded, as well as the indigenous materials that were already in this area. I'm always doing historical research. I love the historical photographs, the sepia tone. Um, I'm in particularly always aware of the Great Lakes photographs, um, maybe because I'm always looking for my relatives who I could be related to, uh, trying to connect my ancestors to who we are today. Um, I also just like to look at the photographs of Indians or natives who really enjoy fashion and who did back in the day. I Am Anishinaabe had its start as the Great Lakes Woodland Skirt Project, which included the fashion show and historical presentation. However, it has grown into a flashy extravaganza that now includes male fashion, and plans are for the addition of different fashion lines. I have a um, deep interest in the two-spirit uh, community individuals, that it's really important that we recognize, acknowledge, and include them, um, not only as um, a group of, of people, but to integrate them in everything that we do. And so I am uh, looking at doing a collection for two-spirit people. Another uh, collection that we want to do too are wedding collections. Yeah, and a lot of people will think of the uh, traditional white from the Western world, but we're really about a lot of colors, so we want to do, I call it Anishinaabe red. So I would like to see uh, the Anishinaabe people wear a lot of red in their celebratory um, occasions. So maybe a, a, red, a red wedding show. Earlier this year, we did a fashion show in Toronto, Toronto's um, Indigenous Fashion Week. We went to Santa Fe, New Mexico. We did three fashion shows down there. One is called a freeze um, modeling, and another one was another runway model modeling, and we hope to do that again because that's really a lot of fun. And we've been to the National Museum of the American Indian in um, Washington, D.C., and that was an a international market as well, so that was super awesome. How do you think tonight's show went? I feel like it went really wonderfully. I am so proud of all the models. I think everybody just really excelled in who they are and they shone and worn the clothes just beautifully. I'm so grateful. Leonard, one of our most respected elders, asked about Parkinson's disease. This is a progressive neurologic disorder with no known cause and no known cure. There are treatments available to help decrease symptoms. While it can happen to younger people, most of the time the onset of disease is at age 65 or older. Men get Parkinson's disease at a slightly higher rate than women, and there is some evidence it can happen in other family members, but the risk of that is small. Parkinson's disease is a disorder of the nervous system that primarily affects movement. The most common signs of Parkinson's disease are arresting tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia, and postural instability. Let's go through those individually. The arresting tremor often starts in one hand and is often barely noticeable at first. Tremors tend to worsen as the disease progresses and is often a pill rolling tremor. This is worse at rest and the tremor decreases with voluntary activity. Rigidity means stiffness and this is usually in the limbs. Bradykinesia means slowness of movement and postural instability means gait and balance problems. The problem is low levels or missing dopamine in a part of the brain called the substantia nigra due to nerve cell damage. Some early warning signs of Parkinson's disease are a tremor, small handwriting, 
loss of the sense of smell, thrashing around in bed or acting out dreams, trouble moving or walking, constipation, a soft voice, a masked face with little expression, dizziness or fainting and standing stooped or hunched over. Diagnosing Parkinson's disease needs to have two of the four main symptoms for a period of time. Again, this includes shaking or tremor, bradykinesia or slowness of movement, rigidity or stiffness in the arms, legs, or trunk, postural instability or trouble with balance and possible falls. The primary treatment is levodopa, although there are other medicines that are used separately or in conjunction with levodopa. There is a myth that levodopa stops working after five years, but in reality it works for decades. Sometimes people are afraid to start it because they think they will use it all up, but taking it dramatically improves symptoms and quality of life. No one can predict how progression will occur in any one patient and taking care of yourself will help. This means getting exercise, adequate sleep, and good nutrition. Once medicines are started, taking them on time is important. Sometimes surgical treatments are recommended and this is a discussion you should have with your health care provider. Remember to call an elder. They've been waiting for your call. I'm Dr. Arnie Vinio and this is Health Matters. There are more than 18,000 military veterans who call St. Louis County the largest county in the state of Minnesota home. To meet the needs of these men and women, the St. Louis County Veterans Service Office has a staff of eight working out of four offices and is led by Division Director Todd Ells. Join us now as we learn more about the mission of the office. It is estimated that 1% of the United States population enlist in the military, but over 18% of the Native American population have served in the armed forces. For the veterans in the state of Minnesota's St. Louis County, a staff of dedicated personnel seek to help veterans on multiple levels. We've got uh, just over 18,000 vets within St. Louis County, which I think is the third largest uh, veteran population in the state. You know, I think Hennepin's first and maybe Ramsey second. We have four offices throughout the county. You know, we have their main office in Duluth along with uh, the farthest outreach, Ely with Norm. And then we've got uh, Russell in Hibbing and we have Tyler and his uh, team in Virginia. The largest challenge that I've seen so far has been, uh, has to do with mental health. For those folks that are reluctant to come in, we have resources with Ernie, who is a, a state a tribal veteran service officer, he has the ability to do outreach to those folks uh, on a one-on-one -on -one if they don't want to deal with the bureaucracy of an office setting. So the first thing is making that phone call. Uh, second is, uh, you know, come into the office and uh, we'll do whatever we can do to help that veteran. The one thing I, I'd, I'd want all veterans to know is that this is a resource that we can get them the help that they need, or maybe even uh, point them in a direction they never thought was even possible. Number one thing is reach out. Let's get you uh, in our system. We, we keep DD-214s on file. We uh, keep marriage certificates on file. The whole intent is to make things easier, not only today, but in the future for maybe it's a surviving spouse that you never thought through. You know, I don't think that any of us uh, thinks about it often enough, but uh, I've never known anyone that's uh, Got not alive, right? <laughs> Setting up, set up your benefits, set up your folks for the future, your surviving spouse, your children, so that the, we can do what's right for you. Who better to help a veteran than a veteran? Ernie Steele and Norman Adams, both from the Boys Fort Nation in Minnesota, do as much outreach as possible to ensure all veterans receive the benefits they are entitled to. I get out to a lot of different places, uh, usually home visits in nursing homes. They usually make appointments and I go there and then I try to get back up to Net Lake and Vermilion at least once a month. Uh, typically it's by appointment only, but um, we try to, get, try to get there once a month at least. So I meet a lot of different veterans and some of them I just meet on the street or I'll see them at, you know, at the, uh, the soup kitchens and stuff like that. So if you're talking about just contacts, it could be about over a thousand definitely. But, <laughs> but if you're talking about claims, then it's <laughs> probably a little smaller. Getting veterans to call in and you know open up, that's usually the biggest challenge that I usually run into if somebody doesn't want to talk about an experience that they had while they're in the military. But you know there's something there, but you don't want to pry too much. It's just kind of 
that's about the biggest the biggest um, hurdle that I have to get over when I'm trying to trying to talk to a veteran if they don't want to open up and talk about certain things. <laughs> if it's PTSD or depression or something like that. And if it would happen while it was in service, yeah. you know, a lot of guys don't really want to open up about about a, an event that happened in their life like that. I joined the Marine Corps. Uh, I think one of the reasons why I joined the Marine Corps, I guess, was, you know, a lot of our community members had been in the military and the different branches and stuff. With time on the job, I've learned how to, you know, learn the VA system. I mean, it's a complicated system. In order to get a claim, there's a, there has to be an event that happened in the military. Then you have a current diagnosis of the, that injury. You know, for example, I had hurt my, my knee in an auto accident when I was home on leave. And, uh, and that was all documented in my military records. And then more recently, I went to the VA and, uh, you know, and I've still got this torn meniscus from that injury. You know, but in between there, uh, you know, I've had medical records showing that. You know, I go to the doctor and, you know, things like, when he hurts. I think it's important that, you know, uh, to try establish that certain connection uh, with veterans, I think is sometimes it can be real challenging, particularly when they don't have, uh, they haven't gone to sick bay or anything, you know. And with the military, in particular, uh, my generation and the generation of Korean veterans and Vietnam veterans, and, you know, they just sucked it up. They never went to sick bay. A lot of times they don't realize that, uh, you know, that they're entitled to benefits. Then the service connection to open other doors like the state benefits and the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the medical and things of that nature. The benefits range from physical and mental health care to burial benefits and monetary compensation to name a few. These are also extended to the family and survivors of military personnel as well. The main thing that we're looking at doing is for those folks that were injured or have a service-connected disability is working with them and advocating to ensure that they get the, um, get the benefits that they deserve. You know, there's a lot of emotions within the office depending on where these veterans are coming from because there's unique nuances. Could be a veteran surviving spouse coming in looking for help and how do I get through the paperwork on the burial benefits? Or if there's a carryover as far as the retirement from that veteran. Um, probably on large as far as the uh, most amount of time we do is, is looking at service-connected disabilities. Say you're, you're a disabled American veteran chapter and you want me to come to your uh, meetings and talk a little bit more in depth on benefits or things like that, I'm more than willing to do that. Along with if, uh, say you're in Italy and uh, we've got Norm up there, we'll set up a time where Norm can uh, come to your uh, local chapter and talk through the benefits and, and give you an idea what our office will do for you. I really encourage veterans to come in and, and see what we're about. And uh, you know, they're entitled uh, to veterans, whether it's, you know, to the benefits of the veterans, you know, education, home loans, uh, medical, uh, you know, service connection, pension, you know, there's a whole host of benefits that they're, that they're eligible for. Come and see. Just come and talk to us. If they're Vietnam veterans or even World War II veterans, um, there's a lot of benefits that guys don't even know about until they come talk to one of us. So Minnesota, uh, along with St. Louis County, along with the resources within the state, just do wonderful things for supporting our military, and I very much appreciate that. I just love young people getting involved and to get those skills and, and, and the things you need to stay above a lot of the issues we have today. I'm talking about drug issues that's plaguing the reservations. And I think we need to, our young people to stand above that. And I think we need to help them do that. And if, if uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons why that happens, not, you know, uh, and, and if, if they could work, and, and like I said before, have that peace of mind where they don't 
aren't, you know, don't fall into that kind of uh, lifestyle. And, and, and it, it, it's tragic, you know, it's a double-edged sword, you know. It, it, nine times out of ten, these, you know, they don't need punishment, they need help. And, and, uh, but if young people could do that and get to school, get an education. You know, not everybody is cut out to be a college graduate, but do something and uh, learn a trade or, or even work experience. Go to work. Be the best that you can be for what you are doing. And uh, I, I think that, and, and also I, I think young people need to grasp or grab onto their culture. We followed artist Carl Gobloy over a period of several months as he painted The Star Maiden, a piece of artwork centered on Native American storytelling. This work brings together Carl's knowledge of art, history, culture, and astronomy in a painting that is truly epic. Along Old Highway 61 near Duluth, Minnesota, is the studio of artist Carl Gobloy and today he's working on a new project, a painting of the Ojibwe story of the Star Maiden. That painting has its beginnings as an ink wash drawing. Ink wash is like watercolor, but without the, uh, without the color. It's uh, with India ink, and the straight black is the straight ink right out of the bottle. And then the ink is mixed with water to make the grays. So, it's actually a lot harder to do than using color, using watercolor. Uh, it's hard because you've got to work all the grays out so they're so it so it looks good. Uh, otherwise, the whole painting, the whole illustration, might come out all gray. So you have to be very careful about mixing the water with the ink on the brush, and then uh, applying it to the paper. You have to make it darker if it's not dark enough, but it's impossible to make it lighter. So I think of the ink wash drawing as my preliminary sketch, so I've already done that. One of the things that I've been thinking about since I was going to start this project is what kind of face should she have? What kind of woman should this be? This be? Uh, I already thought of the outfit she's going to be wearing, and that is her beadwork designs, her quill work designs, are all going to be star patterns. And then, but her face is going to be something kind of important. I want her to be a very ethereal face, and that's going to be my biggest challenge. I'm doing uh, mythological work uh, these last couple of years. I want to go back to my old style, which was the scenes of the everyday, but I keep getting drawn into doing mythological work. I must be doing something right. There's a lot of people who like it. Examples of this technique were on display at the Duluth Art Institute, where many of Carl's ink wash drawings were displayed next to the works of George Morrison and Joe Gizek. Those are going to be illustrations for a book that's going to focus primarily on myth. And so I did about uh, 10 of them for the, for the illustrations. And for the show at the depot, we put them all together and exhibited them for the first time. The story that uh, you're going to be visually depicting is, is what story? It's, uh, it's been called a star maiden. She came down to Earth from outer space looking for the place on Earth where she can live. And she found the Ojibwe people. And so she brought the water lily down because it looked like stars from her home world. And that's how the water lily appeared in our lakes and waters. There are many Ojibwe artists who paint myths. Myths are generally set in uh, a time before this one where the rules of physics and reality don't apply. Myth, unfortunately, has come in English to mean a kind of a negative thing, a, a lie. But that's not the way that I'm using the word myth here. I heard m many of these stories, and then I imagined them the way that I ended up painting them, uh, quite realistically. The thing about the Ojibwe stories is that they may slightly differ from region to region. How a story may be told in northern Minnesota 
might differ from that in western Minnesota, and both may differ from how it's told in central Minnesota. I had uh, grown up hearing the stories. You know, the Ojibwe have all kinds of stories. Uh, how the chipmunk got his stripes. I didn't want to paint the real minor stories. I wanted the big ones, the real big important stories. I think it's good that these differences appear. Just as long as Ojibwe people realize that these differences are something that should be valued, that the differences apply to their own community and to their own region, their own environment. Unfortunately, there are many Ojibwe who believe that the way that they heard it is the only right way, and they get very critical about anyone who tells a story in a slightly different version. The variety uh, should be treasured. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org and on Facebook. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors from across Indian Country. I'm Ernie Stevens. And I'm Rita Aspinwall. We'll see you next time on Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and is an ICWA social worker with Fond du Lac Social Services. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and is a film and television producer. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Blandin Foundation and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation.